Man of Power written by Cyprian Jocelyn. Chapter 1. Waiting. On the night of the election, Sikhan Adelik, also known as Jagaband, was holed up in the luxurious presidential suite of the prestigious Golden Crown Hotel in Abuja, with his closest advisors, waiting for the announcement of the results. The room was tastefully decorated with an opulent chandelier, a king-size bed with plush bedding, a private jacuzzi, and floor-to-ceiling windows that offered a breathtaking view of the city skyline. The air was thick with the sweet aroma of Cuban cigars and assorted drinks. Glasses clinked as French champagne and whiskey were poured, and the room was filled with the delicious aroma of gourmet hors d'oeuvres. The atmosphere was tense as everyone's eyes were glued to the widescreen TV showing the Collation Center's results. As the names of the political parties flashed on the wide TV screen, Segan's advisors made impulsive comments in favor of or against their man, creating an intense debate. Tund, Segan's right-hand man, spoke up first, his voice dripping with arrogance. There was no way we could lose this election. We had rigged it from top to bottom. Beezy, the strategist, scoffed. You may have rigged it, Tund, but that didn't mean we were guaranteed to win. We still needed to be vigilant and make sure we secured the votes we needed. Cunnell, the tech genius, chimes in. I agree with Beezy. We need to stay alert and make sure we don't miss any irregularities. Tund rolls his eyes. You two are being paranoid. We've got this under control. And besides, even if there are irregularities, we'll just bribe our way out of it. Beezy's eyes flash with anger. We can't rely on bribery forever. We need to start playing the long game and build a sustainable power base. Cunnell nods in agreement. Beezy's right. We can't keep relying on shady deals and backroom agreements. We need to start building a legitimate coalition of supporters. Segan listens to his advisors' arguments, but remains silent. His advisors were gathered around a large round table, nervously tapping their feet and checking their phones for updates. There was Tund, Segan's right-hand man, with his slicked-back hair and sharp suit. He was a smooth talker, with a silver tongue that could charm anyone. Then there was Beezy, the strategist, who had a penchant for wearing oversized glasses that made her look like an L. She was brilliant, but could be ruthless when it came to achieving their goals. Finally, there was Cunnell, the tech genius, who was always hunched over his laptop, typing away furiously. Segan was sitting at the head of the table, looking calm and collected despite the tension in the air. Gentlemen and ladies, we've done everything we can to ensure victory. I have no doubt that we will emerge as the winners of this election, he says, taking a sip of his whiskey. Tund nods in agreement. We've spent a fortune on this campaign. From bribing officials to manipulating the media, we've left nothing to chance, he says with a sly grin. Beezy leans forward, her eyes gleaming with excitement, and we've got the perfect plan in place to deal with any challenges that may arise. We won't let anyone steal this victory from us. Cunnell looks up from his laptop, a satisfied smile on his face. More results are coming in now. It looks like we're in the lead in most of the key states, he says, tapping away at his keyboard. Suddenly, the door bursts open, and a frantic aide rushes in. Sir, we have a problem. The opposition is claiming that there's been widespread voter fraud. They're calling for a recount. Segan's expression darkens, but he quickly regains his composure. Alma Lincoln, it's my turn, he told his team. We anticipated this. Beezy, what's our contingency plan? Beezy grins wickedly. Leave it to me, sir. We'll make sure that this recount doesn't change the outcome. With a sense of foreboding, Segan settles back into his seat, knowing that the battle for the presidency is far from over. As the night wore on and tensions rose in the luxury hotel room, Segan Adelik's thoughts drifted to his past. He remembered the struggles he had faced growing up in poverty and the lengths he had gone to in order to achieve power. In his youth, he had been a street boy who grew up in poverty and had to survive by eating from the slums. He had to fend for himself on the streets, sleeping in abandoned buildings, and scrounging for food. He had developed multiple survival tricks and was determined to change his life by walking on eggshells and changing his colors like a chameleon. 
Seekin's advisors, including the cunning political strategist Kaod and the suave businessman Kuyamu, continued to assure him of victory as the first results began to trickle in. However, a commotion broke out outside the hotel room, and Seigan rushed to the window to see a throng of protesters gathered outside, waving signs and chanting slogans against him and his party. Suddenly, a rock shattered the window, and a cry of death to Seigan echoed through the room. But as they tried to leave the hotel, they are met with a crowd of angry protesters outside. Seigan's security team whisked him away through a back entrance to avoid the chaos. Once he arrives home, the weight of the night's events begins to take a toll on him. His mental state deteriorates rapidly as he reflects on the ruthless tactics he employed to secure his victory. He knew that something was wrong. He felt a sudden heaviness in his chest, and a throbbing headache pounded against his temples. He stumbled through the multi-million villa and collapsed onto the couch, gasping for breath. His security men gathered around him, looking concerned. What's the matter, sir? One of them asked. Seekin shook his head, unable to speak. He felt as if a vice was tightening around his chest, squeezing the air out of his lungs. One of his advisors, a thin man named M.C. Alyamo, stepped forward. Maybe you should lie down, sir, he suggested. You've had a long day. Seekin nodded weakly, and his aides helped him to his bedroom. He collapsed onto the bed, panting for air. His head felt like it was on fire, and his heart was racing. As he lay there, he began to remember things he had tried to forget. The bribes he had taken, the promises he had broken, the people he had hurt. He had always told himself that it was necessary to achieve his goals, but now he realized that he had sold his soul for power. He closed his eyes and tried to calm his breathing, but the guilt and fear continued to wash over him. What if his political opponents go to court? What if he is exposed as a drug baron? He committed the crime in Chicago and forfeits a large sum of money, $460,000 earned through drug trafficking. He flees to Nigeria to escape the consequences. I have paid for that mistake, he murmured. He heard heavy knocks at the gate, and one of his security men entered. Sir, there's a problem again, he said. There are thousands of protesters outside the gate. They're calling you a murderer and bloodsucker. He realized that he had to call the chairman. With a deep breath, he pushed himself off the bed and stood up. I want to be alone, he said. I want you all to go back to the hotel, then his security men threw tear gas at the protesters. Alone in his lavish villa, Seigan pours himself a drink and sinks into his favorite armchair. But as the adrenaline wears off, He's overcome by a sense of emptiness and loneliness. His thoughts turn to his mother, and he realizes that he hasn't spoken to her in years. He reaches for his phone to call her, but as he dials her number, he hears a loud noise from outside. It is dusk, and he calls the INEC chairman with the golden phone on the left side of his bed, near the table lamp. Seekin is now alone, pacing around his living room toggling the window blinds to catch a glimpse of his security guards posted at the electrified gate. The protesters have left the place, but he can't wait any longer and climbs up to the first floor of his home. He opens a room where he keeps three black boxes filled with dollars and euros stacked one on top of the other, waiting for the INEC chairman, Alhaji Ibrahim Abdullahi, to come and collect them. Alhaji is a tall, dark-skinned man with a sleek, sinister aura that follows him everywhere. He is the chairman of the Independent Electoral Commission, INEC, who promised a free and fair election to Nigerians. He speaks with a subtle undertone of menace during his press conferences that only the most astute can pick up on. Alhaji is not one to raise his voice or draw attention to himself unnecessarily, but make no mistake, he is a dangerous man, using his charm and charisma to win the trust of the different political parties in the election collation center. He is a Machiavellian figure who believes that the ends justify the means when it comes to politics. He rigged the election in Segan's favor partly because he owes him a favor for helping him get elected to his current position, but also because he believes that Segan is the best candidate to bring stability and prosperity to Nigeria, even if it means bending or breaking the rules. His godfather is the sitting president, Alhaji Bello. He's a shrewd politician who has been in the game for decades and has seen it all. 
He's known for his calm demeanor and ability to make tough decisions when the need arises. Despite being a powerful figure in his own right, he has always seen himself as a mentor to Segan, whom he took under his wing when he was just starting out in politics. However, Alhaji Bello is not without his flaws. He has been accused of corruption and human rights abuses during his tenure as president, and many activists and civil society groups are calling for him to be held accountable. Alhaji Bello is aware of this, and he's worried that if Segan takes over, he might not be as forgiving as he has been in the past. Segan might even arrest him. Despite this, Alhaji Bello is still determined to hand over power to Segan, as he sees him as the future of their party and the country at large. However, as the election results start to roll in and it becomes clear that Segan might not have won the election fairly, Alhaji Bello starts to have second thoughts about his decision. He's torn between his loyalty to Segan and his duty to the country, and he's not sure which way to turn. As the political drama unfolds, Alhaji Bello finds himself in a precarious position, with pressure mounting from all sides. He must make a choice that will define his legacy and determine the future of the country. But he is the drummer in this dance. Before leaving the room, Segan activates the alarm system and rushes downstairs to his favorite couch to catch up with the arranged announcement at 4 a.m. when Nigerians are asleep. That is when Alhaji Ibrahim Abdullahi's face flashes on the widescreen of the home cinema in the living room, declaring him the winner of the presidential election. His shaking hands shoot up in the air, an exhilarating moment for someone who has lived a life of crime, as a former drug lord, killer, and impersonator. The sound of the clock he brought from Mecca during one of his religious pilgrimages breaks his reverie. It is time to thank Allah for his blessings and mercy. A few minutes later, he receives a congratulatory call from the chairman, who asks him to secure his smartphone. Segan assures him in coded language that he will not leave any fingerprints and that the money is waiting for him. Mr. President-elect, Nigerians are sad, Alhaji said. Sad for what? I am Segan Jagaban, the only man standing. Ikemba said he will go to court. He told the press that the process that brought you to power is not excellent so you do not deserve the honor to be called His Excellency, as I day sweet us, I day pain them. Let him and the other contestants go and lick their wound, as I day sweet us, I day pain them. Let him and the other contestants go and lick their wounds. Emma Loken, it's my turn. Sir, Ikemba won the 2023 elections in the 36 states. So why did you declare me the winner? You don't want your money? Alhaji, don't try me. I am the winner, you hear. How much are we talking about here? Alhaji asked. Mr. Chairman, you sacrificed that man for a chicken change of $250 million. All for you and Madam, plus the villa I bought for her in Dubai, Segan said angrily. In that case, Mr. President-elect, I want you to transfer the money in bits of $50 million to five accounts in five European countries. Do the operation from your foreign account. I have to caution you that the certificate of return INEC gave to you and Shamadi, your vice president-elect, can be withdrawn if Akemba wins his case at the Supreme Court. It's a big joke. I am Jagaban, an oil tycoon. I own almost all the media in Nigeria, and the Supreme Court judges are in my pocket. How much is their salary? The international observers said the election is free and fair. The sitting president just congratulated me before your arrival. Nothing go happen. That was when Alhaji Ibrahim Abdullahi brought out his smartphone to show Segan the newspaper headlines in Nigeria and abroad. The social media is on fire, he told him. Look at what this foreign observer is saying, pointing at the article on his phone. Read it aloud for me, you know my head is somewhere else, I have no time, Segan alias Jagaban said. Nigeria is currently suffering from a rampant kleptocracy, where the primary currency is not justice, lawfulness, or ethical principles, but rather theft. This pervasive culture of corruption has eroded fundamental values such as fairness, the pursuit of happiness, freedom, family, religion, work, and prosperity. The ultimate goal is to amass as much stolen wealth as possible, with no consideration for the detrimental effects on the country's economy and its citizens' well-being. 
It is disheartening to witness how the quest for personal gain has overshadowed the need for national growth and development. The government's failure to curb corruption has led to the enrichment of a few at the expense of many, perpetuating a vicious cycle of poverty and inequality. It is imperative that the people take decisive actions to hold corrupt politicians and their cohorts accountable and implement policies that promote transparency, accountability, and good governance. This will require a concerted effort from all stakeholders, including civil society, the private sector, and the international community. In conclusion, Nigeria's current state of kleptocracy is a serious impediment to progress and prosperity, and it is essential that urgent steps be taken to address this demon. Only then can the country realize its full potential and ensure a better future for its people. I will fight corruption in this country, Segan exclaimed. True word, sir. You have to convince me, Al Haji argued. You have greetings from the Austrian press, Mr. President. The billionaire, Segan Adelik alias Jagaband, who has been linked to drug trafficking in the past, has won Nigeria's presidential election. In the largest country in Africa, with 213 million inhabitants, most people live below the poverty line. Alhaji, I am the one concerned here. E. Not you. I will ask Kaode, that chameleon to clean the mess in a press conference, Sigan Adelik tried to calm him down. Okay then, Your Excellency, transfer the money. No stories. Sigan Adelik had always been ambitious. Growing up in a small village in Abiokuta, Nigeria, he had dreamed of making it big in the city. He had wangled his way all through without any formal education, learning, and unlearning on his own, eventually landing a job in the banking sector. But he was not satisfied with a regular job. He wanted power and influence, and he was willing to do whatever it took to get it. His brother, Kola, was the complete opposite. Kola was a school teacher who had always been content with a simple life. He believed in hard work and honesty, and he was fiercely loyal to his family and his country. Kola had always been skeptical of Segan's ambition and the lengths he would go to achieve it. One day, Segan received an offer he could not refuse. A group of foreign investors had approached him with a proposition. They would provide him with the funds and resources he needed when he resumed office as the president of Nigeria. In return, he would push their agenda and ensure that they received favorable treatment in the country. His phone rings, and Segan answers. Hello? Segan, it's Kola. Oh, hey brother. What's up? What's up? What's up is that I just found out you rigged the presidential election and people lost their lives because of it. How could you do this to our country, to our people? It's not that simple, Kola. You don't understand the pressure and the temptation, Segan replied. I understand perfectly well. You're addicted to money and power, and you're willing to sell out your own country and your own people to get it, Kola said. That's not fair. I had to do what I had to do to get ahead. And at what cost? People died because of your ambition, Segan. Is it worth it? I, I didn't know it would come to that. I never intended for anyone to get hurt. That's not good enough. You have blood on your hands, Segan. And to make matters worse, I didn't vote for you, Kola said angrily. What? Why not? Segan asked. Because I knew you were only after power and money, you don't care about our country or our people. Look, Kola, I know I've made some mistakes. But I can fix this. I can make it right. It's too late for that, Segan. You've already caused irreparable damage. I can't even look at you right now. I understand. I'm sorry, Kola. Goodbye, Segan, Kola hangs up. Segan was the older brother and had always been ambitious. He was determined to make something of himself, no matter what it took. Even as a young boy, he would do anything to get what he wanted. He had a natural charm and was able to convince people to do what he wanted them to do. However, his ambition often blinded him to the consequences of his actions, and he would sometimes hurt people along the way. Kola, on the other hand, was content with a simple life. He believed in hard work and honesty and was fiercely loyal to his family and his country. 
He was never one to seek out attention or praise, preferring to quietly go about his business. His loyalty could sometimes make him stubborn and unwilling to compromise. Fumi Adeli, their mother was a strong woman who had raised them both on her own after their father passed away when they were young. She worked multiple jobs to provide for her family and was the main breadwinner. She instilled in them a sense of pride in their Yoruba heritage and a desire to make a difference in the world. She also taught them to respect others and to always do what was right, even when it was difficult. Their father Ade Adelik was a charismatic but abusive man who was a heavy drinker and had a tendency to be physically violent toward his wives and children. Other wives were Bizi, Ao, Kemi, and Tund. They were all younger than Fumi, and all of them lived in an abusive marriage with their children in the hands of a reckless man. Seekin felt neglected by his father and often felt like he had to compete for his father's affection and support. As a result of his difficult upbringing, Seekin learned to be resourceful and independent. He had a natural talent for persuasion and charisma, which he used to his advantage when he later entered politics. He also struggled with feelings of inadequacy and a deep-seated desire to prove himself to his father and the rest of his family. This drove him to seek power and success at all costs, even if it meant resorting to deceit and corruption. As they grew up, Segan and Kola's relationship became more strained. Segan had always been ambitious, and he felt that Kola was holding him back. Kola, on the other hand, believed in hard work and honesty, and he was content with his simple life in the village. Their differing philosophies often led to arguments, and they eventually went their separate ways. Seekin left the village and moved to the city, determined to make a name for himself. He was ruthless in his pursuit of success, and he had no qualms about stepping on anyone who stood in his way. Kola, on the other, was content with his modest salary and enjoyed helping the children in the community. He also became involved in local politics, advocating for the rights of farmers and small business owners. Despite their differences, they would often speak on the phone or visit each other whenever they could. However, there was always an underlying tension between them. Kola had never forgiven Segan for snatching his fiancée away from him. Segan had always been the more attractive and charismatic of the two brothers, and Kola felt that Segan had used his charm to steal the love of his life. So, he was determined to be independent and self-sufficient. He refused any help from his brother the president-elect, believing that he could make his own way in life. Kola also resented the fact that Segan had abandoned their mother to pursue his own ambitions. Segan was a natural leader and had a keen business sense, but he was also ruthless and would do whatever it took to get ahead. Kola, on the other hand, was compassionate and empathetic, but he could also be stubborn and set in his ways. Their mother was the glue that held the family together. She was a wise and respected figure in the community, and both Segan and Kola looked up to her. 